This is the new Betty Crocker cake mix. Smoother batter with easier beating. New directions, too. Just two simple steps. And of course you'll get a cake with that real homemade goodness because you add the eggs. Try serving a cake like this with Frosty. You can get a full package of Lipton's Frosty free for the coupon inside this package of Betty Crocker cake mix. The first time I met you, you mentioned how advertising and advertising agents are often using this hidden occult knowledge to influence us without us even knowing. And you told a, a pretty interesting anecdote about Betty Crocker. Yeah. I want to know maybe you can uh, cover that and then sure. you know anybody can jump in after. But I thought that was a really interesting point. I always you. tell ultra like left brained they're usually ultra left brained skeptics that uh, have thrown the baby out with the bathwater as I like to say. They don't believe in religion, so they've thrown spirituality out with it. You know, and they don't understand that there's a very deep um, hidden aspect to the human psyche that resonates at a core spiritual level that these sick, twisted, psychopathic occultists that are running the world know all about and we know nothing about. I give them two examples, pragmatic real world examples that most people have never heard of. And that is one I call the Betty Crocker conundrum. And then the other one is called Obama's fainting ladies. Okay, so if you look these two things up, I just tell the left-brained skeptics among us in whatever community I I'm talking to, if you look these two things up, you will understand that is the occult, and that's specifically the dark occult. A real-world example of how to change people's thinking by seemingly magical means where you didn't really have to do anything to them, you just needed to know knowledge that they do not know, okay? So the first is, uh, Betty Crocker conundrum. Betty Crocker's back in like the, the 30s or 40s, I think it was the 40s or 50s, um, sh they, they um, had an instant cake mix they wanted to put on the market and sell in supermarkets. And when they, they did all this research and development, came up with the formula for the cake mix, boxed it up, put it out in the, in the supermarkets, it just didn't sell. It was an absolute flop and they wasted like hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? No one was buying it and they didn't know why. Okay, they thought it was going to be an instant hit because housewives throughout America were going to say, oh, look, this is much easier. I could bake a cake now with much less work and time involved and save myself time. And, you know, it's still a good tasting cake. And, you know, they would love it. And it didn't work out that way. They hated it. They didn't want to buy it. And uh, the company had no idea why it wasn't selling. So what they did is they went to psychologists to try to understand why the cake wasn't selling. And this is what the occultists are. Occultists, dark occultists, are ancient psychologists that are absolute master psychologists that come out of the ancient world. Okay, it's a, it's a bloodline of master psychologists that have come down through the centuries into the modern world with deep-seated knowledge of how the human being really works at a fundamental level that the vast majority of people have no idea, okay? So they hired this team of psychologists to figure out why the cake mix wasn't selling. And they went in and did the research and understood the real deep psychological level of why housewives throughout America were not buying the cake mix. And they went back to Betty Crocker and said, we have the solution. All you need to do is add some instructions on the box, a, a line of instructions. You don't even need to change the cake mix formula. It will sell after you add these instructions to your box, your packaging. And it was one line of instructions that simply read, add an egg, add one egg to the mix. And then the cake mix flew off the shelves. So how is that possible? How would it be possible that you put three words on a box and then you completely change the reaction of human beings from discarding it and not wanting it to suddenly get, giving their money and buying it in droves? This is because they leveraged the power of deep psychological knowledge called archetypes. And they chose, they understood that the housewives were feeling guilty. That was the psychological problem that had to be overcome. They were feeling guilty for taking a shortcut. 
That's why they didn't buy it. They said, we used to make our cake from scratch for our family, and that was done out of love. And we want to have effort involved. We want to have care involved in, in the baking of the cake. And to do this made us feel like we're not involved in that process anymore. It was all automatically done for us. And that was like a shortcut. And they felt guilty about it. And that's why they didn't want the instant cake mix. They wanted to put the care and energy into baking the cake because they felt love as a result of doing that. Okay? So how did add an egg change that? It psychologically assuaged their subconscious guilt by putting the archetype of feminine creative essence, the egg, into the process symbolically. They were giving of their creative essence, the feminine egg, okay, to the process of baking the instant cake. And then suddenly, psychological guilt was assuaged because of inserting that archetype in the formula, in the instructions. That is the occult. That's the occult. The occult isn't men and women dressing in black robes and going into a forest and sacrificing animals by a bonfire. That's not the occult. The occult is understanding how the mind works and either helping to elevate it to an enlightened level or exploiting the ignorance of other people through that knowledge. So that's an example of dark occultism in the real world. You know? And then they actually got people to buy something that they really didn't want. It's just as fluffy and moist as the cakes Betty Crocker and her staff make. In fact, Betty Crocker white cake mix is a favorite Betty Crocker recipe already measured and blended. It contains famous soft as silk cake flour and premium cake shortening. All you have to do is add water and fresh eggs. Betty Crocker cake mixes give you a full pound and a quarter of cake mix. That's more than any other nationally sold cake mix. And remember, those fresh eggs added to Betty Crocker cake mixes help give that special homemade goodness. Try Betty Crocker cake mixes and always make big, moist, fresh egg cakes. And that's how that works. Now, the other one is Obama's Fainting Ladies. Okay? This one's harder to find now. It's like kind of been scrubbed from a lot of video sharing sites. During Obama's presidential campaign in early 2008, there were plants in his audience that would faint at an, at an appointed time during his speech at all of his presidential campaign rallies, it would normally be a woman that would be in the middle of the crowd, it was part of his campaign, and she would pretend to faint. Okay, this is what's you know, called a false flag operation at a low level. This is a problem reaction solution event. What Obama would do is immediately recognize that it was happening because he knew when it was gonna occur. They would have it scripted according to what, what he said. And, and at that time he said it, the fainting would be feigned, okay? And then he would be the first to recognize it. And then he would immediately stop his speech, regardless of what he was saying or how important it was. And then he would say, oh, somebody, it looks like somebody just fainted. He'd be the first person to point it out, okay? Make some space for her. Here, give her some of my water. Okay? So what does that do in the minds of the people? It makes everyone think, look at how attentive he is. Look at how caring he is. Look at how smart he is. And he goes, oh, she's probably just a little faint. Well, how did he know she didn't just have an aortic aneurysm? Right? Somebody just went down in the crowd. How do you know they didn't have a, a, a massive stroke? Right? But suddenly, he, he has the knowledge. She probably just felt faint. She's going to be fine. Just give her some water, make some space for her. So he is attentive. He's knowledgeable. He knows exactly what to do. And most of all, he cares. That's the occult. Favorite colleagues in Washington, she is an outstanding Congresswoman. Congresswoman Diane Watson. Give it up for her. Uh, we need, if, if we have a medic, if we have somebody, I think we may have 
somebody outside. Somebody just fell. They probably fell a little bit faint. Are you okay? We need some water. Is somebody still on the ground? I don't know. Okay. All these people trying to get up there. No, Can somebody get them some water? Is she okay? We're out of combat by next year. Do we have somebody who fainted? Hold on, we got somebody who's sick. Can, can we get somebody? We got medical attention coming. All right, let, make some space for her and let her lie down. We've got somebody down here. Do we, we already have the paramedic coming? Okay. Are you a paramedic right here? Okay, why don't you let her slide through? Sorry for the interruption, guys. All right. This is what happens. Folks get too excited about Oprah. If you're clear about your principles, is somebody okay? Did somebody just get faint? Make sure, give them a little space. All right. They're just a little overheated. Make sure that they get some water. Somebody got a bottle of water? You got one? Here. Right here. You got some water? Hey, guys. Right here. We're just going to make sure she's okay, all right? But she looks okay. Yeah, she's talking. Environment for our national security. You know, we, it, looks like, it looks like we have somebody who may have fainted. Give them a little bit of room. And if we had anybody from uh, EMT here, it'd be great. Yeah, yeah, somebody's, somebody's going to be able to just give them some space. They're probably just a little overheated. All right. Can, can people make, make some space? All right. Yeah. And if somebody has some water, there you go. You got, a good, you got good hands? All right, there you go. Hold on a second, young lady. You okay? Why don't you sit down, though? So somebody guide her out and let her sit down, because she's just feeling a little faint. Ed, she's fine. You probably didn't eat lunch. That's the problem. She'll be okay. Why don't you help, help, help somebody help her just sit. Somebody help her sit down. Can we get a chair on the side where somebody can sit down and just, there's a chair over here. Make a path. Make a path. She's going to be okay. Yeah. Looks like somebody might have fainted up here. If we got uh, 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 some of the EMS, somebody. Don't worry about Folks do this all the time in my meetings. I mean, I, <laughs> the, uh, you, you always got to eat before you stand for a long time. That's a little tip. But I, they'll be okay. Just make sure that uh, give them a little room. All right, everybody all right? Okay. The one illness. There you go, you okay. I'm right here. I got you. No, no, you're, you're okay. This happens when I talk too long. You're, you'll be okay. Here, why don't you go? Do you Come on. Good catch, by the way. I'm sorry, what's going on? Somebody's not feeling good? All right. Why don't we, uh, why don't we have, we got, uh, we, can get, we can get our doctors back there to help out. Somebody want to uh, go to my doctor's office and just have them? All right. Where was I? Can, can, some, can somebody help out, please, uh, and get uh, Dr. Jackson in here? 
Somebody grabbing yes, our doctor? Thank you, Mr. President. Of course. In the meantime, just give her a little room. You guys know where the doctor's office is? Because uh, just go through the palm doors. It, it's right, right next to the map room. There he is. All right, there's Doc Jackson. He's all right. Okay. Doctors, doctors in the house. That's how it really works behind the scenes to leverage power. And that's the thing most people in the average community all around us, that would be the exact opposite of what they think the occult is. They would think it's, you know, what Hollywood depicts Satanism as. That's not Satanism and that's not the occult. What I just explained to you is the world of the occult. And that's what we have to know and understand. That's why this movement isn't making as much headway. Because we're not understanding that that's what occultism is. I just want to add to that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> Mark, you brought up, uh, you know, like ancient psychologists. I think that's really an important point because it all has to do with psychology. Is you know whether you're just thinking in terms of the U.S. government having unlimited resources and people like Edward Bernays, you know, what seventy plus years ago, understanding the human psyche and how to manipulate it and how to get people to buy things that maybe they don't even need or want. Like that's what it really comes down to is being aware of these unseen forces that are influencing your way of thinking. And so much of the things we see in the media, controversies, you know, scandals, et cetera, are just scripted. These are scripted things to make you feel one way or look this direction or not this direction or you know, talk about this and be offended by that. So it really does come down to that subtle thing, which I think brings back the importance of just knowing yourself, getting to know your own heart, your own mind, and being in tune and being able to take things in and say, okay, you know, use those critical thinking skills like, is this bullshit? Does this fit with the truth that I know? Or is it something that needs to be rejected or just completely ignored? That's right. As a brief addendum to that, you mentioned Edward Bernays, who really bastardized and perverted some of Sigmund Freud's psycho psychological practices. I just want to recommend three great documentaries. Check out um, Century of Self, which is a phenomenal expose of that. A new theory about human nature was put forward by Sigmund Freud. He had discovered, he said, primitive sexual and aggressive forces hidden deep inside the minds of all human beings. Forces which, if not controlled, led individuals and societies to chaos and destruction. This series is about how those in power have used Freud's theories to try and control the dangerous crowd in an age of mass democracy. At the heart of the story is not just Sigmund Freud, but other members of the Freud family. When this episode is about Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on the 20th century was nearly as great as his uncle's. Because Bernays was the first person to take Freud's ideas about human beings and use them to manipulate the masses. He showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. Out of this would come a new political idea of how to control the masses. By satisfying people's inner selfish desires, one made them happy and thus docile. It was the start of the all-consuming self which has come to dominate our world today. Let's say a word about dreams. We all have thoughts which we never knew we had. They are too uncomfortable, too incompatible with our adult self to be remembered. Yet they are often disturbing, rumbling under the surface like lava in a volcano. 
The dream is the royal road to these thoughts. The royal road to the unconscious. This is the story of how Sigmund Freud's ideas about the unconscious mind were used by those in power in post-war America to try and control the masses. Politicians and planners came to believe that Freud was right to suggest that hidden deep within all human beings were dangerous and irrational desires and fears. They were convinced that it was the unleashing of these instincts that had led to the barbarism of Nazi Germany. To stop it ever happening again, they set out to find ways to control this hidden enemy within the human mind. At the heart of the story are Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna, and his nephew, Edward Bernays, who had invented the profession of public relations. Their ideas were used by the US government, big business, and the CIA to develop techniques to manage and control the minds of the American people. Those in power believed that the only way to make democracy work and create a stable society was to repress the savage barbarism that lurked just under the surface of normal American life. Don't settle for anything less than you can be. Make your life a masterpiece. This is a series about how Sigmund Freud's ideas about the unconscious mind have been used by those in power to control the masses in an age of democracy. Last week's episode showed how Freud's ideas spread throughout America in the 1950s. They were promoted by his daughter Anna and by Freud's nephew Edward Bernays, who invented public relations. He brought Freud's theories into the heart of advertising and marketing. A man like you, I mean, with a car like this, what they both believed was that underneath all human beings was a hidden, irrational self which needed to be controlled both for the good of individuals and the stability of society. But the Freuds were about to be toppled from power by opponents who said they were wrong about human nature. The inner self did not need to be repressed and controlled. It should be encouraged to express itself. Out of this would come a new type of strong human being and a better society. But what in fact emerged from this revolution was the very opposite. An isolated, vulnerable and above all greedy self. Far more open to manipulation by both business and politics than anything that had gone before. Those in power would now control the self not by repressing it, but by feeding its infinite desires. the story of the rise of an idea that has come to dominate our society. It is the belief that the satisfaction of individual feelings and desires is our highest priority. Today we're going to tell you how to get whatever you want. I wanted to live a different life that wasn't available to me in the image I was born. I am here. Look at me. Notice me. Previous episodes have shown how this rise of the self was fostered and promoted by business. They had used the ideas of Sigmund Freud to develop techniques to read the inner desires of individuals and then fulfill them with products. This final episode is about how that idea took over politics. It tells the story of how politicians on the left in both America and Britain turned to these techniques to regain power. They believed that they were creating a new and better form of democracy, one that truly responded to the inner feelings of individuals. But what the politicians didn't realise 
was that the aim of those who had originally created these techniques had not been to liberate the people, but to develop a new way of controlling them in an age of mass democracy. The roots of the story lie way back in the America of the 1920s with one man. He was called Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays had been one of the inventors of the profession of public relations, and he was fascinated by his uncle's theory that human behavior was driven by unconscious sexual and aggressive drives. Many of Bernays's clients were large American corporations, and he was the first person to show them how they could sell many more products if they linked them through images and symbols to those unconscious desires that Freud had identified. The strategy he offered them was that people could now look at the goods that were emerging within the society and not merely view those goods as things that they needed in order to deal with some specific material want but also as goods which would stroke and respond to deep emotional yearnings. You know, how this bar of soap or this bag of flour will make you a happier, more successful, more sexually appealing, less fearful person. Somebody to be admired rather than reviled. The powerful people in that world are those people who are capable of reading the public mind and giving the public uh, what it wants in those terms. And Bernays was at the heart of it. Bernays was the guy who was the foremost articulator of the theories which were driving this new system. Check out Psy War, Psy War, P S Y W A R, Psy War. Here in the United States, we're often brought up and told we don't have propaganda, that we have a hard charging investigative press, we have this educated skeptical, even cynical citizenry, and that if there were powerful interests trying to manage and manipulate public opinion, uh, they would be exposed. That's where the word came from, for propagating the faith. Uh, and that's the way the word was used up until the early 20th century. And then what emerged, particularly with World War I, was the application of this propagating the faith to refer to international affairs, to refer to what a national government would do, a national security policy. Equating super patriotism with militarism, military endeavor, military achievements, military struggles and victories, that's all supposedly a special manifestation of super patriotism. The state flourishes in time of war. The state goes stronger in time of war. The state accumulates power. The military is enhanced. The forces of repression are enhanced. War is an opportunity for the government to grow in power. The American dream is a story about how society works. The American dream says that if you work hard, you will succeed. Now the bedrock of our economic success is the American dream. It's a dream shared in big cities and small towns across races, regions, and religions that if you work hard, you can support a family. And so he says, we might start off at different positions. There are people who are rich and there are people who are poor. And they're born into different kind of contexts. But the playing field is level. That's the dream. That's the dream of, you know, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. The problem with that is that is actually at odds with how social mobility works. Social mobility actually is much more based upon class and upon the resources that you have available to you in, in, into which you're born. There are class structures that keep people mostly in their places. If you can control the stories, you don't need to have soldiers on the street corners to control them. You can control people in their own heads, in their own imaginations. Uh, the definition of uh, polyarchy that we have in the social sciences is a system where the participation of masses of people is limited to voting among one or another representatives of the elite 
in, uh, in periodic elections. And in between elections, the masses are now expected to keep quiet, to go back to life as usual, while the elite make the decisions and run the world until they can choose between one or another elite another four years uh, later. The last election, 2008, the advertising industry gives a prize every year for the best marketing campaign of the year. 2008, they gave it to the Obama campaign, who beat out commercial competitors. The idea is we market candidates the same way we market toothpaste or lifestyle drugs or automobiles. If a decision is made by a centralized authority, it's going to represent the interests of a particular group in power. If you mean by democracy a system that accepts that the relative distribution of power and influence and wealth and income uh, in the society is sacrosanct, if the social system we call and know as capitalism is inviolable, then you've just ruled out democracy. and check out State of Mind. Human beings form habits. At some point in our lives, many of us realize that the lives we are living are not those which we have imagined, but rather lives reflecting others' imaginations, as if we have been unwitting actors in someone else's script. Are we acting out the artificial roles created by others who have successfully harnessed our minds through our habits? To answer that question, one must first learn how the minds of individuals can be harnessed by systems of psychological control. Are the habits reflected by human beings in direct conflict with their needs to survive and thrive in this world? The enormous implications deter many of us from asking these simple questions and finding answers relevant to our daily lives. If we don't resist uh, all of the different information that comes our way and weigh it and, and use our own mind instead of what somebody else wants us to think, eventually uh, society will become nothing more than automatons, robots. The establishment has so, it's protected itself unless you submit to the saturation indoctrination and ab adopt all its values, you can't get in. Everyone needs to find out and really think about it, what is going too far, because all of this is happening so fast, you need to be ahead of the game, they're ahead of the game. Humans subjugate themselves to control because they're born into it. And the tyrants and the social engineers know how to incrementally begin to slowly ratchet up the manipulation, the domination, uh, the oppression, so that people never really recognize it coming. It's the old analogy of the frog in the boiling pot. You throw a frog into a boiling pot, folks in Louisiana will tell you this, a bullfrog, he'll jump out. But if you put him in a cold pot, turn it on simmer, heat it up slow, he'll boil, and he'll never see it coming. Well, I think it has a lot to do with group collectivism. And like, go back to John Dewey, you know, he hated the individual. He hated the rugged individualism of Americans. They had to get rid of that. And Carnegie very deeply involved in that. They even talk about getting rid of that, huh? And so I think that when you've been reduced to uh, a member of the group, the collective, whether it's through sensitivity training that teachers have to go through or whether, you know, it's in your own community, like we have a community-oriented policing system, you know, where they give you a medal, if you do a good deed, well, you know, you're, you're part of the collective with the police. I would say in the next 50 years, if large numbers of people don't become consciously resistant to the overall mind control exerted on society, we're going to see many more people who really truly resemble androids. People induce this themselves by looking out at the world and saying, it's too dangerous for me to tell the truth or to say what I really believe or express how I really feel. It's much better if I fabricate a completely synthetic personality that's going to sit back here and remain passive. 
That's how it works. The idea of, of short-term gain, basically giving up freedoms. Freedoms, giving up freedoms is never a good idea. Since the dawn of time, small groups of human beings have instilled artificial circular limitations on the minds of their subjects through the procession of history. Traditionally, the limitations are imprinted on the servile population through a cunning use of language, instruction, and media for the purposes of conquest, social cohesion, and authoritative order by harnessing the human resources of the broad population. Human history reflects countless stories, regardless of what era you happen to live in, and the common thread throughout these stories is that of the struggle between the state, whatever its form, and the individual, the goal of which is to harness and subsume the individual, willingly or unwillingly, into its group collective. The role of authority is a predatory system that sees the individual basically as a unit of energy. The first forms of mind control go back to prehistory. And you would simply have a priest class that uh, developed technologies of herbs and medicine and had a value to the tribe. But pretty soon the priest class would start uh, studying the sky and when there were solar and lunar eclipses and would say, hey, uh, the sun's not gonna come back on this date unless you make me king or unless you give me total control. And the people would say, okay, we saw the eclipse when you said it was coming. You know, the snake god ate the sun to the moon. What do you want? I want your firstborn child, sacrifice him to me. Every culture does that. Every culture at one time or another demands human sacrifice because that's the state or the priest class demanding absolute, total fealty and submission to it. Mind control has existed since the dawn of time. Only the methods have changed. Elites have always known if I can control the minds of my people, I control them. Only the technology has changed. It's still the same program. It's never stopped. Sun Tzu, uh, within the, the, the works of the art of war, talk about the fact that if you can understand your enemy so well to the level of where you can psych him out, basically defeat him before you put one boot on the battlefield, you, you've become a true master of your domain. The Greek author Plato embedded several key characteristics of ruling groups in his monumental work known as the Republic. Therein, he introduces the term cybernetics as a description of steering the ship of state, emphasizing crowd control. Plato memorialized the essence of the scenario used to control individuals to this day, to make them part of the group or state. This is famously known as the allegory of the cave, a useful strategy which is emblematic of the history of mind control. The idea of cybernetics first shows up in Plato's Republic, I believe it's book six, and in the Greek original text it's read kybernetes, but you can easily discern how this word tied into cybernetics, the control of not only nations, but how the making of individuals into the collective that forms the nations came about. As we've moved through history, every great leader has had to understand the, the potential of information, the potential of speech, the potential of words, the potential of books. What is a citizen, if not someone willingly or unwillingly participating in the machinations of the state? How would we acquire the habits of citizenship without stimulus from the state and our response to it? assist the state, a 14th century Italian named Niccolo Machiavelli crafted several books intended to help the ruling elite dominate their subjects with the most effective psychological warfare techniques available to the world at that time. 
and he was trying to convert the Medici family into hiring him to provide political advice. Conspiracy is the story of history. It's the story of plunderers taking care of people who produce. They claim to take care of them through government, which doesn't give you anything. It doesn't take away first. So it's not creating something out of nothing. It's very real what they're doing. They're taking your rights or taking some people's rights and adding more to someone else's rights. Concurrent to Machiavelli's efforts, the consequences of tyranny were sowing the seeds of liberty throughout Europe with authors like Etienne de la Boetie of France leading individuals to consider their situations and discover effective means to achieving liberty for all. So this whole idea of Machiavelli telling the ruling elite how to do this in a more efficient and you know, uh, you know, effective manner without people directly knowing about it. But his mistake is that these books get out there and other people start to read these books because it's not just the ruling elite. Uh, this starts to have an influence in Europe. You've got a character named Etienne de la Boetie who writes a discourse on voluntary servitude. And basically what Della Boetti does is he shows you that everything that Machiavelli told the ruling elite about how to control you is undone when you understand it to the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts level where you can then withdraw your consent and that on, only then are you free. We control you. We control your mind. We make you believe you have no creative power. We make you forget you have imagination which is the core capability from which you can invent your own reality. These are all about this type of man mental manipulation and mind control that is part of dark occultism. So those documentaries can help you to understand that dynamic. Totally agree with that. If you want to see Century of the Self, there's actually a link to it on my website. I've had it sitting there in my recommended viewing for the last 10 years. It's a, it's a great thing. I don't really think there was a question in there, so I don't really know what to say on that. But what Mark was saying about um, the manipulation through those two um, um, the anecdotes that he gave you, think about that on a world stage. Think, realize the fact that all of these governments work together. You've got one criminal cabal, which has insinuated itself over human consciousness and is masquerading as the heads of all these governments. And when you look at that little charade that they had at the Obama election with the fainting ladies, Think about, you know, Trump visiting North Korea, the first president to visit North Korea, which is a state set up by the CIA after the Korean War. I mean, what was all this about? All this theater happens on a macro level as well. So, you know, pay attention to what's going on, folks. It's all scripted, the whole lot. I'd like to add a brief addendum to what Max just said. Regarding Obama's fainting ladies, when you, if you can find the video still, okay, uh, and you watch it, this practice stopped immediately after videographers caught it and strung them all together in 13 sequences to show that it was happening over and over and over again in a scripted in the exact same fashion. And that goes to Max's point of, if we shine light on this, they can't get away with it anymore. That's when they had to stop because too many people were catching on that this was a, a, a tactic used to get a, a support for him psychologically. $21 trillion. Oh, we have a, a woman just fainted. Okay, take your time. Take your time. Do we have a doctor? Doctor? Do we have? Okay, take your time. Take your time. Well, we love you too. Doing okay? Doing okay? She doing okay? Okay. So you, you have doctors? You have water? Do you have water? Get some water over there right away, please. Right away. Get some water over. She okay? Okay. Yeah, get some nice air put in there. We love our people. We got to take care of our people. No, we got to take care of our people. We got to take care of our people. Who cares? We'll hold it for a couple of minutes, okay? We got to take care of our people. These are great people. She was here. You know, some of these people came at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we got to take care of our people.
Hillary, Hillary for prison is right. How is she doing? I love her too. Just tell her to take it easy. Take it easy. Is she doing all right? Okay. Well, you just go ahead. Just gently walk her out and she'll be fine. She'll be fine. But let her rest backstage and she can come in for the end. That's beautiful. I love her. I love these people. They're well. I love you people. Good job, doctor. Where's the doctor? Uh, a young doctor, young, handsome doctor. Good. Two doctors. We got a lot of doctors. We got great people in our audience. She's surrounded by doctors. She's surrounded by doctors. No thanks to Obamacare, that I can tell you. No? So how's she doing? Good? Beautiful. I love it. Thank you, darling. I love it. So what we're going to do, you take your time. Okay, she said, go ahead. We're going to go ahead. And if she wants me to stop, I'll stop on a dime, okay? We're going to go ahead. Thank you very much. Mark goes right next to me. And Chris Christie is grilling him like a good prosecutor. And Chris is grilling him, grilling him. And Marco keeps... Uh-oh, we have somebody else. What is it? All right, we need a doctor. A doctor. We have a doctor. A woman fainted. A woman fainted. We love, we love people that faint. And I think it's only faint. Are you okay, darling? Okay. Take your time. Take your time. Those are the people we like the best. She's been here for seven hours. I love you, darling. Get better. Get better. We'll send you flowers. You're going to be fine. We love you. Those are the people we love, right? Those are great people. They love our country, I will tell you that. So we have a lot of decisions to be made. So now I hear the new way of stopping Trump because they're giving up. Oh, that's, you know what? Those flowers are for me. Here's what I want you to do. Run up and catch that woman and give those flowers to that woman. I love that. How you doing, man? That's nice. That's nice. So, is there a doctor in the house, please? Doctor? Doctor, please. Thank you. Say a little prayer. Go ahead. Say a little prayer. That's good. something I want to just thank everybody for the way you behaved that was beautiful and that at the end was beautiful amazing grace thank you very much that was beautiful hopefully she'll be okay oh if you think about it if you think about it just take a look are they okay darling you take your time we got to be with our people right we got to be with our people is she okay? Take your time. Do you have a doctor? Doctor, please. It's what?
Yeah, yeah, oh, take that, move that partition. Yeah, move it. Take care of the person. Good. Good. Whoa. You okay? That's good. That's good. That's good. You take your time. We have plenty of time tonight, right? Yeah. Plenty of time. Don't forget, I know you get here seven, eight hours ago. It's not easy. It's not easy for these folks with those really good prime locations. Thank you very much. Okay. Are they okay? They're okay? Oh, she just fainted. She's, you know what? That means she was excited. <laughs> That's okay. Make sure she's good. Those are my best fans. The ones that faint, I love the most. That's fine. Okay, everything good over there? Okay, take your time. Take your time. Make sure she's perfect. I noticed they have a couple of ambulances right outside, just in case. But that's, that's great. I love you too. I love you too. I love you too, but I love her, and I want to make sure she's okay. Is she okay? All right, good. I think, I think they're going to be fine. Everything good? Let's get going then. So, a doctor. You have a doctor, a woman fainted. A woman fainted. We love, we love people that faint. And I think it's only faint. Are you okay, darling? Okay, take your time. Take your time. Doctor, please. A yeah, doctor. A doctor, please. Thank you. A doctor, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. It is about a hundred degrees in here, folks, so thank you so much. We love our supporters, right? Let's give her a hand. Yeah, get some water, please. Water, Kevin. Get some water, please. Take your time, don't worry. We have all the time, right? Yeah. Are you okay? It's okay? Are they okay? You all right? We got to stick with our people that wait here for hours and hours, right? Come on. Are you okay, darling? Good. She looks good. We got to stick with those people. Anybody in this front row, they've been here for many hours. Thank you, darling. Thank you. 
Thank you. And come back. If you want, come back after you get a little bit better. You come back, darling, okay? Come back, all right? You come back. Make sure she gets back. We'll bring her up here. Beautiful. Thank you. You don't need, Mr. President, you don't need North Carolina, the 9th District. You got someone? All right. Got someone heated over here. Give them some space. We need a doctor. A doctor in the house, please. Doctor, please. Doctor in the house, thank you. Take your time, please. Take your time. We have plenty of time. Thank you. Take your time. Sorry. Thank you, doctor. Take your time. People have been staying outside for two days to get in, so this happens. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Doing better? Good. The elitist social engineers, the dark occultists that really run the show, they actuaried out the results of the uh, 2016 presidential elections. Okay? Can you explain what, what actuaried were, out means? Yeah. Actuaries are very, 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 very high paid and super intelligent people that deal with statistical analysis. OK, and what they do is they're hired for companies and government agencies to actually run simulations, nor usually through very powerful supercomputers to determine based on extremely complex and a large amount of complex variables. What will actually occur if a certain action is taken by the company, government, etc. OK, so this is like. You know, to a couple of people speculating on things, you know, say, if I invest this money here, what will my possible return on investment be? Or if I take this action regarding my, you know, what I do here with, uh, you know, let's say what on earth is happening or what you, Vinny, do with your, your line of work, what will occur if I do this, right? Well, we might speculate on it and ask some friends their opinions, but that's not a guarantee that that's what's going to happen. If we took millions of variables and ran them through some of the most powerful actuarial supercomputers available that these people who do this type of analysis use, we would actually be able to determine with a high degree of accuracy, often upwards of 99% accuracy, what will actually occur in the real world based on the mindset of all the people involved and all the environmental variables and social variables involved. It's ultra complex and requires like tens of trillions of calculations per second to, to be able to do this in huge supercomputers. Okay. So actuaries get paid a lot of money to do this. Just look up the job. Okay. Most people have never even heard about this. I actually have a, uh, not a friend, I wouldn't call him, but an associate who is an actuary. Okay? So he's an actual and, actuary. Okay. It, correct. Correct. Yes. So, um, basically, uh, I believe that the government, uh, or the, really the, the, the power players behind the government, uh, actuaried out, uh, the, a scenario of what would happen if Clinton got elected versus what would happen if Trump got elected. And they saw that it was actually to their benefit to withhold Hillary Clinton getting into office, which a lot of people thought was a given, and to allow Trump to take the presidency because of how balkanized and polarized he would be able to sway the political left into a total extremist position, often of socialism or communism outright communism, which is what you're hearing people actually ask for in the United States because of Trump being the president. And 
he they also saw how much support there would be for the United States swinging to that political left by other countries in the world, especially countries in the European Union. OK, they actuaried all of that out. And that's why they allowed Trump to take the presidency, because they knew through his very brash demeanor, OK, that he was going to actually balkanize the political left. So when the pendulum swings back to the left in the next election, it's going to swing extremely hard in that direction. And you're already seeing we're already seeing here in the United States the beginnings of that. I'm telling you, people here in this city and almost all the very populated centers where all of their social engineer mind control universities are at are actually calling for outright socialism and communism in America because they believe that Trump represents uh, the, 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 the radical capitalist position. OK, and they hate him so bad that they're calling for the exact opposite. This is like when someone realizes religion is bullshit and is a big lie. And, and then the person goes toward the dark occult like I did. That's what happened with me. It's called a balkanization or a, 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 a polarization technique. It's a mind control dialectic. I call it polarization dialectics is my term for it. OK, it means you're trying to get people to swing from one false extreme to another false extreme, but never seeing the actual truth that lies nowhere near those extreme positions. And they give people this position of, oh, labor or conservative, Democrat or Republican, uh, 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 socialist or capitalist, OK, communist or capitalist. OK, all of these are false choices and people don't understand this, especially a lot of po people who still follow politics and believe in politics in foreign countries, which is why this whole idea of there's a lot of hate for Americans is, is coming up. You know, it's actually true. It's, it, it's definitely true, but it's because they've also been politically balkanized and this polarization tactic has worked upon their minds. It's a mind control technique. And they actuary that in highly, highly powerful supercomputers to figure out what would be the degree of radicalization we would get with Clinton as president versus the degree of radicalization and balkanization politically that we would get with Trump as president. And obviously Trump won out in that scenario, and that's why they allowed him to take that position. And guess what? Look at the polarization. I My first show back that I did in 2019, in j last January of 2019, this was the topic. The polarization that has happened in our society, especially in, in the United States, as a, since Trump has taken the presidency. It has never been a wider divide and gap. There has never been more political tension and hatred between groups of people over uh, which slave master should rule over us, should be the puppet that, that uh, ostensibly rules over us, when in fact the, the real power brokers in positions of power truly ruling society has never changed. Yeah. They're brilliant at what they do. They're brilliant at what they do. And people still haven't seen through it, which is why they continue the same tactics and techniques, because they don't need to change their tactics and techniques. People are still so stupid that they still buy it. You know, by understanding the work that you put out and understanding these dialectics that the, you know, the machine, the people that are controlling it put out, you can understand the way they try to play us against each other as yeah. well as against your own mind. That's and right. I really think that, I mean, we have to, I'd say, pause for a moment to really take in the uh, just the, the fantastic nature of this, the current psyops that are going on right now. And the reason I say that is not obviously because I enjoy them, but just to, to truly step back and to see the amount of indoctrination that's going on. And it's this, the fracturing um, of the truth, freedom, you know, this kind of conspiracy community, all, whatever you want to label it. We are now at a point that when we look to the future and reflect back, we're going to look back this time period and there will be people who literally believe that Donald Trump was elected because he was an anti-establishment candidate and, and that he is a good guy. And obviously we know that nothing's going to happen of that. But when they reflect, they'll be like, oh, we almost beat them. But, you know, the deep state got their guy in. And then there will be those of us like us who reflect and like, wow, remember when all those people got tricked into yeah. it? So there literally is now a fracture. Just like the left bought into Obama. Exactly. And now it's like they, they took the truth freedom movements. And, and it just really blows my mind because it's historically, if you think about, you know, our culture, our research community, writing about this time period, there literally will be two different narratives sure. between those who fell for it yeah. and those who didn't. That's right. And people who are still clinging to things like QAnon and all this kind of crap, like the mass arrests are coming. Yeah. And then you have people, what I would consider the false independent alternative media like Alex Jones, who I think time and time again proves himself to play that role. He's literally now, along with Mike Adams of National News, telling people that martial law is going to be declared by Trump, but it's a good thing. 
just be patient. Let the good guys take over. Wow. They're going to arrest all the deep straight traders and anybody. I haven't really them. been keeping up with it much. I don't either, but I caught somebody. Saying, I caught wind. This is just in the last two weeks. I did a video about it for those who want to see that on our channel. Kind of reflecting on it, you know, this is not an attack on Alex Jones. For those who are big Alex Jones fans, listen to the words he's saying. He is saying. Obama put this law into place, Trump's going to use it, but for good purposes. And then he'll arrest everybody and we'll have mass tribunals. Oh. And they even said, we know Americans will have a gut response to martial law, but this is a temporary thing that needs to happen to get rid of the bad guys. Oh I mean, it's, it's insane. And, wow. and, they, and obviously this guy's got millions of listeners who eat up his every word. And so it really does sometimes frighten me to accept the reality that they there is a push towards civil war i don't necessarily think the country's as divided as they would like us to believe but it's those dialectics of getting the extreme yeah. from each side to oppose each other and to keep people in a state of imbalance you sure. know so and and this is all coming of course on their their precious election right this they one of the reasons many of us believe that they're purging these pages is because we're three weeks from the election Many of us would be spending the next couple weeks telling people yeah. how voting is a waste of time, right. how the system is full of it, how these people are corrupt, and now none of those stories will be seen by they those millions of people. No alternative narrative. Absolutely. They want their own narrative to be the only narrative that is out there for public consumption. And that's a dangerous proposition. You know, especially again because most people's minds still are very softened to accept propaganda. They haven't steeled their own mindset against things like this. They don't understand the tactics that are involved and used as far as PSYOPs go. And the PSYOPs, like you said, they're working beautifully. You know, yeah. we have the QAnon PSYOP. You know, we have, you know, Flat Earth versus Globe Earth PSYOP going on, you know, okay? And, and we have the polarization going on within that community. You know, we have uh, people who believe, you know, uh, if we just vote the right people in there, you know, everything's going to be okay or we're going to have this you know, hero show up politically that's going to save the day. That's a big, you know, uh, psyop in, you know, the whole political movement. Um, you know, I think to a certain extent, people uh, banking on the fact that cryptocurrency is going to be the savior of the day could be almost a form of a psyop. I mean, yeah, it's great to have an alternative currency in place so you don't have to rely on the Federal Reserve System, but we can't be looking at that as any kind of savior of humanity. Yeah, nothing is a panacea at this that's point. Right. There's no golden, you know, key that's going to fix everything. It's a combination. And this is why, you know, last night in the talk and throughout this tour, I've really been trying to... Uh, emphasize to people and maybe I need to be a little more harsher and take a take a page out of your book and get them to see because truly I, I you know I'm speaking at like say Anarchapulco or these different beautiful festivals in beautiful parts of the world and I'm thankful for it I'm having a good mm -hmm. time but I stop and I look around and I see these people and I'm like okay there's people here some of them are genuine here to learn they really care mm -hmm. about the planet but are they gonna do anything different right. when they go home or is this all just a big party for us to get together and share some yeah. ideas and feel good about this it. This isn't a social event for people like you and I. No, we not really at all. seriously want to see real world change for the better uh, regarding human freedom occur. And that takes real world action Absolutely. by mass numbers of people, not a few people. Yeah. There's a big psyop that I think has been put in place by the new age community is only very small numbers of people are required to make v big changes happen. I've never bought into that and believed it. Uh, yes, small numbers of people are usually the most driven and can drive change, but the, the, the change has to happen in a large percentage of the population for it to really flip an overarching social dynamic to the other, Especially to the other polarity. Especially the amount of control we have now. That's right. I mean, it's not like we're just trying to shake off one little, you know, like, oh, okay, we just got to stop them from doing this one action. No, we right. have this whole system with multiple attacks from multiple different ways that can't just be voted out, can't right. just be... You know, it's all predicated upon a belief system. Absolutely. The belief system, as you talked about last night, as I've been talking about, is the belief in authority. That's the ultimate religion that we have to break down and start to get people to stop believing in. You know, and that's a taller task than it seems because they're tied to it. They, they have a personal emotional investment in it and they have a, uh, an identity invested in it. it th this is what identity politics means. It means that you actually make your identity you know, about your po political platform or party mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a human being. And that's a scary thought to identify with a, a team or, a, as I would call it, a religion. And I would even call it something much stronger than that. I would call it a cult. And I think this is what we have to really start identifying government and political parties as. These are cults. They're dangerous to people who really want true freedom. 
It's not just a mindset. It's not just a religious mindset. It's a cult mindset. Absolutely. You know, and I think we have to stop euphemizing the language and just say it out, out in the open as what it is. You know, the belief in government is a cult. Absolutely. You know, and uh, I think if we put it out there more for people like that, and we relate to how this is a, a dangerous religion, and it's it's just as just like other extremist religious beliefs. Yeah. I think people who uh, understand that uh, religious fundamentalism and extremity. Uh, is not a c good and conducive thing for harmony and humanity. So a lot of people do understand that in the political activism space, you know. But they need to see how their behavior is like a cult. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they they haven't made that connection. They haven't made that association yet. Unfortunately, I like what you were talking about last night regarding how you know in in your activism work you tried to get people who are involved in purely political activism to see the. Uh, the spiritual aspects of what needs to change and go on in, in, in their mindset and in their spiritual lives and they didn't want any part of that and then you went to the new age and spiritual communities and you were trying to tell them about all the negative aspects of what's taking place in the whole political machinations of our world and they didn't want to hear that and they were saying don't oh don't talk it. about the negative don't and manifest it <laughs> yeah no it, it was this I found myself going back and forth until as I said last night I sort of just for about a year and a half, I just I was I accepted that that was the reality, right. but it became increasingly hard because as you sure. know, like when you realize that these are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I had you know one of those sort of shifts. I was up for three days straight just researching, and like that phrase, the conscious resistance came, and I was like, I can't. There's no need to separate this. I can't like yeah. pull it apart. It says it all in one phrase. You know, to me, it, it has to be consciousness. Yet you have to resist all of these negative things and these negative uh, polarities and and uh, you know mind control techniques that are being employed against us. And that takes internal spiritual resistance. So Absolutely. it's a it's a good combination of terms. Uh, for like you know a movement or a, you know a uh, a project, mm -hmm. and um, you know uh, th this whole idea that they have totally split people into almost two camps, and never the twain shall meet. You know mm -hmm. the spiritualists aren't going to get into the whole you know. Uh, uh, control system aspects and the people who are very reactive to the political machinations they don't want to learn the spirituality aspects and the consciousness aspects and these things have to be bridged yeah. we're never going to make headway unless we bridge those dynamics and, and we get people to awaken spiritually and then decide I'm going to pull away from any support that I may have been giving Absolutely. this cult and this belief in authority and then we'll see real world change start to happen Absolutely. So, well, I want to I want to reflect on that as well. Again, sure. you know, you're totally right. It's a cult. I mean, there's really no other way to look at it. I, I did a video two years ago called "Voting is a Ritual Meant to Divide," and sort of saying this. And I know you've talked about this before. That the thing about cults, they all have their sacraments. They all have their rituals. That's right. And the the election period, the vote is of course one of those biggest rituals that That's they right. have. And it's absolutely meant to divide people. And in the the last election, twenty sixteen election, the video I did was basically saying how, you know, you have this polarity of this extreme masculine kind of authority figure in in Trump and some people are like, Oh, you know, he'll come and just stamp out our enemies and then you had you know, it's kind of difficult to associate Hillary with feminine, but she was playing that old grandma role. Sure. You know, she's the I will need the here to kind of be all nice to the Hispanic mm -hmm. community. So you had the feminine and the masculine, mm -hmm. polar opposites, but also polar extremes politically, and just trying to tear people apart at the seams and take those different aspects and, and pick one, choose sure. one. You know, and it's it's absolutely important because we're coming up to the midterms. We're you know two years away from the presidential election, but we'll be hearing about it before we know it, mm -hmm. and. It is just a way to keep people constantly indoctrinated, constantly opposing the other tribe. And I recently participated in a very mainstream video on a mainstream YouTube channel where it was voters versus non-voters. And of the voters there, each of them sort of expressed in their own way that they were content and thought it was a, a meaningful strategy to shame non-voters. Like, this is the other thing that they're being reinforced in the narrative, wow. is shame them. Shame. I, I recently uh, was at an event confronting John Kerry, and at that event, John Kerry and all his politicians were speaking, saying, you know, you tell your neighbors if you don't like what they're doing, why not shame them if they don't vote? And they talked about using some software where they could identify all the non-voters in the neighborhood and send their neighbors letters to say, hey, your neighbor didn't vote in this election, put some pressure on. I mean, so this is oh the way that we're, they're so desperately scared yeah. that people will step away from yeah. the game and not play that they have to keep the indoctrination on full blast, yep. full steam ahead. And that has all the signs of what a cult needs to do. They don't want sure. anybody to challenge the leader, to challenge the rituals and challenge the sanctity of yep. them. And anybody who does must be shamed. Keep people isolated, fighting with each other, 
and uh, just uh, com completely repeat in a repetitious fashion all of the indoctrination that you want to uh, pump into their brain. That's how cults have always done it. It's been the techniques of cults for thousands of years. And uh, one of the most important aspects of the, the indoctrination techniques that they use is the reason that there are only two political parties is they're going to a very deeply seated psychological dynamic that exists in most people, and that is parental abandonment issues or even just parental um, uh, uh, inadequacy issues. So we all have that to a certain extent in our lives where, you know, probably very rarely do any of us have perfect parenting, Absolutely. okay? And most of us have absent parenting in, in many cases, unfortunately, in, in the kind of, uh, you know, culture of divorce and polarization between men and women in the genders that exist in our world today. So, so many people have parental abandonment issues of one kind or another, and that's why there's only two political parties. They can't have a third political party because there's no such thing as a third parent. You know, you have to have uh, people with mommy issues trying to identify with m the mommy aspect of government, which is the taking care of everybody from the cradle to grave, the nanny state. Yeah. That's the Democratic Party in the United States. And then the people who want protection from cradle to grave from a strong father figure, that's the Republican Party. Those are the people with daddy issues, you know, and that's the, you know, the, the, the right side of the uh, political equation. And so they play these two dynamics off against each other. And most people don't understand anything about their internal psychological makeup and the shadow work that they need to do to work through different types of abandonment issues and different psychological, um, you know, distress that they have or trauma that they have gone through. And they're not doing that shadow work. They're not doing that internal dynamic shadow work upon themselves to work on themselves. They're, they haven't done any aspect of it m in most cases. And so they're perfect targets for the type of very deep psychology that we're talking about that, that plays into these cult belief systems, namely parental abandonment issues. And that's the reason for the two polarized political parties. One represents mommy, one represents daddy. Absolutely. It's genius. Yeah. It, like you said, we're saying about the psyops techniques. You know, if we are going to give the people who are doing these manipulations their proper due and not take them lightly and realize what we're really up against, they have a very advanced psychological strategy going for them yeah. that has worked perfectly over a period of thousands of years. They don't change their formula because it has worked upon the human population and unfortunately continues to work. We have to see these dynamics for what they are and clearly be able to break them down and pick them apart and explain them to others. And once we get that understanding, in a more deep-seated way out there into the population, maybe people will start reclaiming some of their power when they start doing some of the psychological shadow work that needs to be done to start to steal their consciousness and their emotions against all these types of mind control techniques that are out there. But uh, you have to give the enemy proper credit. that there, It's a genius strategy, and their strategy works because they know our psychology better than we know our psychology. If we shine light on this, they can't get away with it anymore. That's when they had to stop because too many people were catching on that this was a, a, a tactic used to get oh, a support for him psychologically.